All right, what's up, Podcast Land? Episode number 112 featuring Brandon Kellum is brought to you by Silence and Solitude. Based out of southern New Jersey, Silence and Solitude is a metalcore quintet that consists of Shane Roxas, Colby Hempel, Cody Mitchell, Alexander Coates, and Justin Pomper. The band formed in early 2015 and made their debut in September of the following year, 2016, having spent the previous year writing and recording. So what did they do during that whole year? Well, they released their debut album, Resurgence, of December of last year, 2016. And guess what? It debuted at number 20 on the iTunes metal charts. And they have also released music videos for their singles, Suffering, Deceiver, and for the cover of Mariah Carey's All I Want For Christmas Is You. Couldn't really do it too loud, but eh, whatever. <laughs> I mean... You could take my word for it, that's an, that it's an awesome album. You could take their word for it, that's a great album. Or you could take New Transcendence's word by saying Resurgence is a must-listen for 2016, without a doubt, especially for fans of metal and its subgenres. If you're looking for something that is emotionally powerful, but not too whiny, aggressive, but not hate-filled, and will stand the test of time, this is the album you've been searching for. For more information, visit www.silenceinsolitude.com. Episode 112 is also brought to you by Old Self. Based out of Tom's River, New Jersey, Old Self fleshes out ambient rock melodies with poetic arrangements while using people's stories as the concepts and lyricism for their songs. And that's pretty damn cool, isn't it? They help bring people's dark thoughts to the public in a very unique manner. Their hope is to reach out to not only their fan base, but to everyone they come across with in a therapeutic way. Recently pairing up with the with the uh, blah, blah 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 blah. Recently pairing up with the nonprofit organization A Voice for the Innocent, they are working on furthering their outreach in hopes that they can help as many people as they can in a positive way through music. For more information, they're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Old Self Official. Episode 112 is also brought to you by From the Deafs. Forming in 2012, From the Deaths is a five-piece metalcore band hailing from northern New Jersey. They have two releases under their belt, their EP The Last Time, and their full-length Animosity. Along with playing shows as much as possible, they're writing more music for another release in the near future, which is actually coming pretty soon. And I think we'll have more information for what that... For the, I can't speak today. Jeez. <laughs> it's one of those days, people. I am sorry. I am terribly, terribly sorry. They do have a, another release coming soon. And we'll have more information on that. But for now, for the information they have already, they're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under From the Defs and J. That's from the D E P T H S and J. Easy enough. Not defs as in like people that can't hear. Like defs as in the water, the depth of the water. Yeah, you, you, you got it. And last but not least, episode 112 is brought to you by 627. So. For a second, imagine the Foo Fighters and Muse. They're stuffed in an underground studio during the nuclear holocaust with nothing but Weezer and Radiohead albums to session. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be a fly on the wall for that too. Now you can, thanks to 627. Delivering the attitude of the underdog and the punch of the champion. 627's chunky guitar riffs, charismatic vocals, and emotional solos are the most beautiful ass whooping your ears have ever took. For more information, hit up dub7records.com and like them on Facebook. Facebook.com slash 627627. -627. That's Facebook.com slash S-I-X-T-W-O-S-E-V-E-N-627. So spell out 627 and then the numbers 62 and 7. All there. So I think that's it. So let's get into it. Today features Kevin speaking with Brandon Kellum of American Standards. And it starts right now. From out of the wasteland of generic podcasts and radio shows, one has emerged. It prides itself on having conversations with the most talented musicians from all over the world. If you like a boring question and answer interview, this isn't for you. If you want deep conversations about anything and everything, you've come to the right place. Your new favorite show starts now, and its name is Behind the Barricade. All right, we are rolling with some new audio equipment. How you doing, Brandon? Doing pretty good, Kevin. How about yourself, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, I've I just 
brought up this new rig and it's kind of sloppy but it works so I'm happy with that hey we'll trudge through it right right so let's talk about American standards right yeah what do you want to know so for one you're the lead vocalist and recently you just uh, dropped a video for writers block party which is you guys uh, getting rowdy in what appears to be a cafe you know structured around making fun of every stereotypical hipster <laughs> you know, I'm glad you picked up on the hipster thing. I didn't know if that would really come through in it. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we wanted to do. We basically wanted to uh, it, kind of find a setting that didn't make sense for us, and which we've definitely played in these types of settings before, put on our show like we normally would, and have the, the reactions that the crowd would have in that type of environment. Um, the initial idea for this, uh, and this is something we had pitched actually for an old video um, for our last release, was uh, finding like a retirement home and putting the show on in the retirement home while the people are playing bingo and things like that around us. And then we thought a little bit more and we we're like, well, it'd be really cool if we could incorporate our friends and our fans into the video. So that's when we thought, well, let's do it as an open mic at this coffee shop. And, and uh, less, half of these people are people that actually came for the video. But let's also keep the doors open just in case anybody else wants to stumble into it. And let's film their reactions too. You know, I actually loved that. Uh, I watched the video for the first time, like a couple, like you know, a couple days ago, and I thought it was the funniest thing because, firstly, you of course you know the comedy action group, The Lonely Island, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, their video boombox with Julian Casablancas uh, actually went ahead with "Let's film this in a nursing home," and let and and everybody got crazy. And also the technique of having people uh, in a uh, Sorry, in you know, in an open space, but also with people already designed to be there. It's like it's the like having a play inside a bar, but nobody knows that there's a play going on except for the actors themselves. Yeah, exactly, and that's kind of uh, what we were hoping for. We were really hoping to get some genuine reactions, and then also just kind of have some fun things thrown out there where people can make their own ideas. So when we when we started asking people, you know, what do you want to want to play in this in this video it quickly came from us being the good guys of the video where you know we're playing our show and people just don't care about us to us seemingly being the bad guys of the video because now people are giving us like their laptop to break and i threw someone's iphone around and, and i'm like wow i'm just kind of bullying you guys now like antagonizing you as you're doing your thing um but it was a lot of fun to shoot no i'd imagine and also i i also picked up on that vibe that you guys kind of came off as being obnoxious and rowdy and getting in everyone's face and disrupting the vibe and at the end of the video there's just one guy left and he just looks really confused so he just claps awkwardly and then he leaves <laughs> the end of every one of our shows uh i'd actually yeah actually let's talk about your live show for for example like i hear that you know one of the biggest things that sets you guys apart from a lot of other bands is the fact that you guys just get absolutely down and dirty most you know musicians at you know outdoor festivals uh you know, Michael Franzino from A Lot Like Birds, for example, is known to uh, dangle himself from a structure 60 feet up. Bands like The White Noise, they throw water bottles into the crowd, they, you know, hang from the rafters. Yeah, and, you know, with us, I think uh, if we can get everybody to go to our show, I think we can get everybody on our side. Because regardless of what audience we're playing in front of, and we get put on some really, really uh, random bills sometimes from pop punk to death metal to indies not kind of like promoters just don't know where to fit us so we get put on these shows where a lot of times we're going in as the underdog and the first you know first 30 seconds i think people are scratching their heads saying you know is this something that i like do i do i really get this but generally by the end of the show we kind of got everybody on our side and i think that's really gone to our advantage because it's allowed us to not only draw people from you know bands that you know sound more similar to us but also bands that, and fans that possibly would never give us the time of day, but since promoters are putting us on this wide range of shows, um, you know, from bands like Rings of Saturn and Winds of Plague being really heavy stuff to softer stuff like Emery or, or Artreyu and, and bands more like us, like Every Time I Die and Norma Jean. Across the board, all those types of shows just have such diverse crowds, but I think uh, we get the crowd to have a lot of fun and they they kind of understand what it is for the most part. Or they absolutely hate it, but they were going to hate it in the first place.
Yeah, that makes sense, uh, and that actually, fa and, that, and that's a you know that makes first impressions the most important thing. Whether it's just your first meeting someone for the first time, or you're listening to music again for the first time. So, on that, um, I have to ask, what is it that you think brings people in when they're you know after they're done scratching their heads, or what do you think it is that turns them off? What turns them off? Um, yeah, this is a good question. I would say. For the people that don't get us, um, it's generally, there's this like kind of craving to always have the most extreme version or the most concentrated version of something that you like. And I think that's kind of what we noticed. Uh, we've all been playing in bands for 10 or 15 years. So what we noticed when we um, first got into music was that a lot of the bands that we loved, the bands that were deriving from those bands or influenced by those bands, they were taking only the most extreme parts of that their those bands, you know, the the heaviest parts, the the most brutal breakdowns or the catchiest choruses. And and what happens when you do that, I think, is you make something that's so overwhelming because it's just nonstop. You know, you've got some of these bands that just shred nonstop and you can't really call out one particular point of their song because the entire song is insane. So I think um, what makes us much different than that is we're almost this continuation of like this early 2000s, late 90s hardcore, maybe even post-hardcore or metalcore. Uh, the continuation of that, if bands decided to keep going that path rather than trying to outdo themselves or trying to compete with other bands. Um, so I think what might turn people off in today's um, world is when we're playing a show, we're not playing, you know, 10 breakdowns uh, back to back and getting the crowd to uh, kill each other back to back. We, we play with a lot of dynamics there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of contrast between parts and even between songs. And um, some people, I think, when they're at a show, they're not ready for that right away. Um, but I think over time, it also kind of, they, they start to realize what it is and maybe appreciate that more. Yeah, no, that's a, no, that's a great response. And I've, been, and I've been thinking that as well, because in the past week alone, like I've been exposed to so much different music and I've been coming up to so many different artists and so many different settings, right? And it's like, uh, there are so many different aspects to what puts me on to a live show and what you know turns me off of the band the uh, hardcore bank the hardcore punk band uh, vana for example you heard of them oh yeah 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 so my first show april 25th 2015 i'll always remember this one right uh, I get to the venue and you know everything's kind of chill everything's you know going all right and then these guys take the stage and Davey uh, Moise screams into the crowd that he wants everybody to start crowd surfing right now and he just turns everybody up and it is honestly probably one of the most whack things I had ever seen at the time and I immediately just ran to the sides right and just watching everybody just miss out towards the stage and while they went crazy that was for me a massive turnoff but then after like you know eventually i kind of came back and listened to the, to like the rest of their music and i just and i loved it but at this uh, but at the time that was my first impression it was kind of hard for me to move past that you got what i'm saying oh yeah you know um we played with since we played with so many uh, different styles of bands we played with some bands where um, for example, we played with Knock Loose um, not too long ago in Expire. Both very heavy hardcore bands um, kind of bring out, in my opinion, the worst in some crowds um, because a lot of people, you know, fight at their shows. And, you know, two songs in, I mean, first off, when we play, we play before them. Uh, when we play, the crowd's, you know, having a good time. They're, some people are mosh pitting, some people are circle pitting and singing along. It's just kind of a mix of every type of uh, reaction you can get. But as soon as the, those bands came on, um, I think it was the first or second song of, of Knock Loose, they're literally dragging kids, like teenage kids, like 16, 17 year olds, out completely knocked out cold of the audience. And everybody in the crowd is loving it, you know? So the next day we, we look online on, on you know, our Twitter and, and our other social media, and we see people tagging about how awesome the show was and how there's 15 kids that got knocked out and how great that is. And that's what turns us off um, for heavy music and that's what we don't want to be you know we, we're not tough guys at all I think uh, part of what American Standards is about is about the fact that we know we don't fit into that crowd and we don't fit into that scene uh, we love the music and we want to show people that you can play heavy music but not to need to be these um, people that are kind of flaunting your uh, machismo or whatever you want to call it 
No, 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 no. I, I fully agree. And that, I think that's why hardcore actually gets the bad rep that it does for being this sort of cesspool of toxic masculinity. Now, hold up a second. Now, what I mean by that is like, I mean that people associate it with they need to get violent. They need to get, you know, super, let's, you know, swing our arms around and basically knock the hell out of everybody around us. Uh, this poor girl at a Code Orange, uh, at a Code Orange concert. Did you hear about that? The one in Utah, right? That's right. She, you know, got yeah with a uh, steel-toed boots, no less. Yeah, and just like uh, just like I said with the social media, when you see that, that's such a uh, polarizing thing because you've got half the comments are saying, you know, she shouldn't be in there in the first place. Uh, the other half of the comments are are obviously saying, you know, um, sympathizing for her, uh, which I would definitely fall on that side of the sympathizing. I think at any point, it doesn't matter if you uh. If, if you're out there and you're having a good time, that doesn't mean that you're also opening yourself up to get kicked in the face with a, a boot, steel-toed or not. Um, so when I saw a lot of these people defending and hiding the, uh, um, I guess, the, the person that, that did it, um, it made me think it, it's no different than if you're driving a car on the road and you get hit by somebody. That person that hit you didn't mean to hit you, but they're still responsible for hitting you. They still have to pull over and you know take the responsibility to say i made this mistake and now i have to own up to it so in this exact situation here regardless of this person with uh, the boot or the steel toed boot or whatever it was meant to or didn't mean to uh to kick this girl um they still need to own up to that and still need to to uh you know help her out i mean the way that it was handled is just embarrassing to be in that scene no absolutely um and people, while people have also been, you know, nothing short of, you know, that you know, side of violent, people are also have been kind to people who are in that, you know, who are close to that radius of violence, right? The Devil Wears Prada, I'm sure you know them. Yeah, it bring, I mean, it does. It brings out some of, some of the best in people, um, which, like you saw with the crowdfunding uh, that took place. Um, I mean, people that didn't even know her, didn't even live in the same state or even country. Um, it really brought them together in that way and then it also really tore people apart so I mean like I said kind of going back to polarizing sometimes stuff like that is um, depending on where you lie in that spectrum uh, discouraging but also uplifting to see what can come from it no absolutely and like I said before about Prada right like my parents and I'm just a you know I'm just a teenager right I go to college at this you know university up here and my parents are always kind of afraid because they're kind of also new to this culture of you know uh, metalcore and hardcore and all of that um, and, I, and I went to this uh, show and I was in the pit and I get dragged down to the bottom and there's a boot about to come down on my face. I look up, I see the foot coming and just right at that moment, a pair of arms just pull me right out of the pit. Oh, wow. No, man, it was, no, no, it was crazy. I was honestly scared out of my life for that one instant and I, I just stayed on the, at the back seat of the, of the, you know, crowd for, for the rest of the set. But at the same time, there are people still willing to help out you, you know, help you out if you're, you know, in, in that situation. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, it, it's interesting because I think that the different bands and, and the different types of cr crowds that they draw, you can really see the difference between a, a crowd that's there to have a good time and yeah, they're going to mosh pit or, or slam dance or whatever they do, um, but they're not intentionally trying to hurt each other. And you can also see the bands that the second they hit the first note, um, the entire pit opens up and everybody is out for blood and they've got what they call crowd killers people that are just purposefully running back and you know kicking against the crowd against people that don't want to be a part of that scene and, and in a lot of ways I think that ruins it um, for the people that are there just to have a good time or in your case like you said if you're relatively new to it if that's the first thing you see that that easily turns you off from it um, I had a conversation with a venue owner here in Arizona uh, recently and he's been you know promoting shows and booking things for 15 or 20 years and he kind of talked about how he thinks um heavy music and extreme music in general is going to change a lot over the next five to ten years um when it comes to this more underground style of music uh because venue owners are now being forced to to purchase insurance plans for their venues that are much too expensive than they can afford for what these shows are returning at the door um so so naturally the venue owners are going to have to decide do i want to pay all this money for insurance on a show where something like this may happen 
and, and maybe only 30 or 40 kids will go to this show? Or do I want to decide not to book that type of band and, and to go with something more mainstream or, or less uh, risky and dangerous? Um, so kind of his impression that I took from this, um, and I can see where he's coming from, is um, hardcore music and metalcore and underground music in general may start to live more on the internet um, than it does at live shows. Not to say it's going to completely be torn away from live shows. There'll always be DIY shows, um, and there'll always be, always be venues that are willing to take that risk. But a lot of the small venues, um, one thing like this happens, like with the, the girl in Utah, and that can close down an entire venue. And, and closing down an entire venue is, is not only putting those venue owners um, you know, out of a job, but that might be their sole source of income and the way they provide for their family. It was probably their dream, you know, something that they always wanted to do. Uh, so it's kind of crushing their dream, and it's also taking away a place for bands to play and for art to come uh, come together, you know, to build that community. Oh, of course. No, I completely get you. Uh, I'm sure. Again, now I'm now I'm kind of going back into you know uh, further back into into history. Bands like Falling in Reverse. You remember that whole Six Flags controversy when Ronnie Radke threw a mic stand, and as a result, you can't like no more heavy bands can ever be booked again at you know Six Flags. Yeah, and every time I die, I had the same thing at Disney World or Disney. Yeah, Disney World here recently too. Yeah, no, no, no. Like I saw their, I saw their Twitter post about it, and they were, you know, angry. And Alternative Press is still asking questions, but they never received any answers. But that's presumably to take away the same thing, because you know how every time I die can get right. They're not necessarily the crowd killing type, but they're definitely rowdy. They're yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love those guys. Um, that's a detour from your story there, but uh, we we played with them last year, and out of all the bands we played with, and all these bands that we've always looked up to, that we've got to share the stage with, every time I die was the most down to earth band. Um, you know, they drank with us before the show. They invited us back to the hotel after the drink. We were, you know, watching professional wrestling with them. Um, they gave us a pre, uh, pre-screen pre of their new album. So we actually got their new album on vinyl like a month before it came out. It's like the story you want every band to have um, when you play with another band. Um, but very rarely ever happens. That's amazing. I uh, Wow. How did you look? Kudos to those guys, man. I hope if we, you know, I, I, I definitely don't have no delusions of grandeur that we'll ever be that big. But if we ever do get to the point where uh, someone cares to hang out with us uh, before or after a show, I, I hope we can take after them and, and do that same thing. Um, as opposed to the, the countless bands that we've played with that we shared a couple words beforehand or said, hey, good set afterwards. No, absolutely. And that actually brings me to an important point that, uh, I think we also need to address, in addition to violence in the scene, we need to address idolatry. How do you... Can you put it in uh, a little bit there, sir? No problem, sir. Uh, what I was trying to talk about is idolatry in the music scene. Okay, okay. Uh, what do you think? Well, for one, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a complex topic for me, right? For example, like the band Under Oath and Norma Jean. Uh, Norma Jean more so because they kind of captured my heart with Polar Similar and they've held it, you know, since I've been going backwards through their discography. Under Oath was the first actual heavy band I ever listened to and uh, when I picked up the drums about a year ago, actually yeah, it was back in January of 2016, that uh, I, I first set myself to learning, uh, you know, every, you know, everything I can off to find the great line. And you're a drummer, right? Yes, sir. Awesome. Good deal. Yes, sir. Um, and you know, being able to, when I meet my favorite musicians, when it's, when I met the Devil Wears Prada, when I met the Color Morale, uh, Slaves with Johnny Craig, all those guys, you know, trying to remember to keep it in perspective that they are just guys with the microphone, that they are just the guys behind the instrument and on the stage, and they're the only difference between my, myself and I, while also trying to capture that they are, you know, fantastic musicians who cross the country, who cross the world. How do you, uh, for example, in that position, keep it in perspective? I'm sure that American Party standards for American standards is growing. And I'm sure that, you know, as you've been able to meet Every Time I Die and Norma Jean and Hands Like Houses when you guys toured with them, all of these are fantastic bands. How do you keep it in perspective? How do you keep it real? Yeah, I think um, just the same as you said, is like you really have to uh, think these are just guys that were exactly like us playing shows with 
you know, little to no expectations and something bigger came along and they've kind of been writing it since. And, and you know, in today's world, who knows how long you're going to be able to write that for. So they're, uh, they're kind of just in it for the flow as well. So I think when we're playing with these bands, um, like you said, we just try to treat them uh, treat them as regular guys. And I, I think they appreciate that. And I know that that's what we appreciate because we never want to put off a perspective of us being better than, than any other band or even better than a crowd. You know, the whole idea of when we play a venue and I see this huge stage or there's a, there's a barricade, um, I personally hate that. I'd rather be right in the crowd, um, you know, being with them, you know, kind of uh, being part of the crowd because that's all we are. We're, we're fans ourselves. So I think that's kind of how we treat it. Um, I also, maybe another interesting spin on that, I think uh, my perspective may have changed over time. I, I've definitely, you know, been playing music for for quite a while, half my lifetime at this point. Um, so I think when I was younger, I probably had a lot of that. I remember doing a Warp Tour back in 2005 and 2006, and standing on the stage right next to the drummer of Under Oath as Under Oath is playing on the small stage of Warp Tour, and just being completely starstruck, um, and. I think that's something special, you know. I think if you can hold on to that feeling as long as you can, it keeps it really exciting. Um, so that that's something special to have. No doubt about it. And actually, it's funny you say that because last year was also the first year that I went to Warp Tour, and being able to, you know, cross paths with uh, bands like uh, Hail the Sun, uh, Donovan Malero, like uh, being able to meet him. Uh, being able to meet the guys from Silent Planet, um, Amorosa, all of these bands, and being able to, you know, be so captivated, I think that's a very special thing. And I think that even as I'm just kind of starting my descent into the music scene, I think it's definitely something that sticks with you. Yeah, and it'll stick with you for a long time. I think the coolest thing... Um that you're, you're likely to experience, and, and I know I did, and, and the rest of our guys kind of have, is that as you first get into it, and you have that feeling of like awe, and like the mystique that goes behind uh, some of the bands and some of the artists that you look up to, um, as time passes, five, ten years from now, you're gonna find hundreds, if not thousands, of new bands, but you'll always respect those bands that got you into music. Um, even now, as I think, um, you know, I'm 31 now, as I look back when I was 15 and 16 and first getting into music, I, I look back at those bands I was listening to at that time, and knowing that maybe the music wasn't the most technical or the most um, complex music, I have such a great respect and fondness for it, because it just, it's the music that got me into this whole new lifestyle. And, and to this day, you know, 15 years later, um, I owe pretty much 95% of the people I talk to on a daily basis, um, including my job, including my girlfriend, all to music and all the places I've traveled over the world, all the new things I've tried because of it is all as a conduit that the band has provided for me. Um, so you'll always look back at bands like, um, like you said, like Amorosa and Being As An Ocean and, and other bands that you saw at Warp Tour and as you're starting to uh, go to shows more often, you'll look back at these bands years from now and just think, wow, that's a uh, that's really cool, you know. All these bands will come and go, but those ones will stay for you. Exactly, um, and that's and that's actually my question to you. What was it for you? You know, I got into a, and this may may go back to the whole idea, of knowing that uh, some of these bands aren't as cool to say in our scene, but I have so much respect for. I don't care, dude. You can say whatever you want. Music, um, I, and I, I started off on guitar. My dad actually bought me a guitar in my freshman year of high school. Um, I was into things like System of a Down and Rage Against the Machine um, when Slipknot came out. Slipknot was, you know, huge. Those types of bands made me realize that you didn't have to be this really good-looking uh, dude that had tons of talent. You could kind of, you know, get by just with having something to say and, and a good idea uh, or way to put it out there. So that's really what made music accessible for me. Um, then as I started playing more, I start getting into bands that would be more considered like hardcore bands, like Poison the Well uh, was a huge one starting off. Me Without You, uh, Alexis on Fire, and, and Zayo. Zayo was absolutely huge for me. I think Zayo is the first thing that uh, that made me realize, uh, being huge into Pantera, Zayo was the first thing to kind of bridge me into more of a metalcore style. Um, 
and right now I'm more than thrilled to say that we're actually in June, um, June 24th, we're playing with Zayo on their first run of shows on the West Coast in almost 10 years. Um, they're doing three shows on the West Coast, and we get to play that show, and, and I'm, I'm just thinking, wow, this is like something that when I was 15, I would never have imagined in a million years that the band that got me into music would be a band I'd be able to share a stage with. That's yeah. That's that's pretty fantastic. Uh, do you know the band? Do you know the band Beartooth? Oh yeah, yeah. He uh, he was actually in was it Asking Alexander, right? Uh, Caleb Shomo was in Attack Attack, but I'm not really concerned with him. I'm oh, talking. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm talking about uh, Connor Dennis, the drummer. Actually, studied under Aaron Gillespie. There's a couple of YouTube videos where Mr. Gillespie from Under Oath is teaching Connor, you know, rudiments and gro and simple grooves and off beats behind the drum kit. And then all of these years later, all of a sudden now, Under Oath and Beartooth are now touring with with Bring Me the Horizon. Yeah, that's huge. Hey, yeah, Beartooth has been killing it lately. They're just on the tour with uh, Every Time I Die not too long ago as well. That's right, and Fit for a King, right? Yeah, and you know, on that tour, I think Beartooth was actually headlining. <laughs> so uh, Every Time I Die opened that show. I remember going to the show here in Arizona, and surprisingly, that's the first Every Time I Die show I had been to in 15 years where more people were there for Beartooth than Every Time I Die. And the Every Time I Die crowd was noticeably older, obviously. Uh, guys in their mid twenties and thirties, um, whereas the Bear Tooth crowd was a much uh, younger crowd that was singing along to every word. Yeah, I'm actually only just now tapping into uh, every time I die. Uh, Wanderlust was what got was what really got me listening. You know, what I'm saying uh, off of New Junk Aesthetic, and uh, I didn't want to, and I didn't want to join your stupid cult anyway. I love that song so much. You know, from the new album Low Teens, um, I'm well. First off, I'm the I'm a huge, huge fan of um, some of their old stuff like uh, Hot Damn. The Hot Damn album is probably the biggest influence for, for American standards. Um, so a lot of people that like Every Time I Die, um, when they go back into their older stuff, when there's a little bit less melody and a little bit less structure, uh, they don't care for it as much. So when people don't care for us, they normally don't care for the Hot Damn album by Every Time I Die. Um, but, but for their new stuff on this album, Low Teens, they have this song called Map Change, which I think is actually their next music video they're putting out here in a couple of weeks. Um, that song is probably my favorite song they've ever put out. It's so, so good. That's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to start checking off the boxes of, these, of, of, new, of more new albums from Low Teens. Um, who else am I, who else, you know, recently dropped a new record that I'm, that I'm not thinking of because I feel uh, coming out here pretty soon is from a band called 68. I feel like I've heard of 68. It's actually Josh Scoggin from uh, the original singer of Norma Jean. That's right. He went on to do, uh, The Chariot for a while and now he has a band called 68. It's a two piece band. He plays guitar, he sings, um, and then they have a drummer and they've been playing for a few years now. We've actually done uh, quite a few shows with them. But they're really good. They're like the heaviest version of rock and roll that you can be before being hardcore. Um, it, it's fantastic. And it's got some indie influence. It's just really cool. Really riffy stuff. Really harsh vocals, but also a lot of melody in them. Um, so it's, it's, it's cool. It's got new CD. I think it's coming out here within a couple months. Frankly, I'm intrigued. Uh, I actually, yeah, I, the only... The only Josh Gogan that I was ever treated to was probably my first influence, was probably my first shot of Norma Jean, which was, honestly, Memphis will be laid to waste, and that was terrifying for me. And I kind of put... That, that was probably my introduction to Norma Jean as well. I, I, yeah, I actually ended up putting them down. I actually ended up putting them down for a very long time. I think I, you know, revisited them briefly when I heard the Ah, Shark Bite, Ah, Ha, Ha um, track. Nice. This is kind of a funny story about Norma Jean. Uh, when they first started, they were called Ludacris. And um, I want to say they That's right. had two vocalists at the time. Um, yeah, they were like this weird like rap metal band, weren't they? I about that. But I remember at this time, I was in a band that was doing a lot of stuff like, like Deftones covers, basically. And I was playing oh. guitar for the band. And, uh, and we were making flyers at this uh, like Office Max or Staples, some kind of store like that. And this girl, she's also there making flyers, and she's a local promoter. We didn't know her, but she, she gives us this flyer, and she said, come check this band out. They're hardcore. And um, I'm thinking, hardcore what? You know, like hardcore punk? And I'm thinking, like, Misfit Fits and, and Agnostic Front and things like that. And she's like, no, it's hardcore music, like metalcore. 
you know, just come check it out. And that band was actually Norma Jean. Oh, man. So it kind of first put my the term into my mind of what hardcore was. And then at that show, remembering seeing people slam dance for the first time and that being relatively um, newer, at least to the, the scene around here and, and seeing the divide of people thinking, you know, what are these people doing karate in the pit, you know? Um, so it's kind of funny. And, and even with Norma Jean, that's another one we've played with five or six times. We've got to do their 10 year tour, uh, the 10 year anniversary of their album. And um, another one where I was completely blown away. No, but that's actually mind blowing. Yeah. But like, my yeah my first introduction to hardcore was i stepped out I, I stepped out of the car and i walked to the line uh you know people waiting to get into the venue and my first thought was i don't actually belong here <laughs> no but like i was like you know wearing you know, no no it was a, it was actually uh it, it was actually like that vana show that i was talking about and i was and i was just wearing like yeah, and I was just wearing like you know a T-shirt and like a pair of, and like a pair of jeans, and I looked absolutely ordinary. And somebody and people next to me are like you know wearing snapbacks and plaids, and you know they're about to they they were about to pit. <laughs> that's that's funny. You know, I think um, that might be something that, and maybe this is a insider perspective um, since I'm in the band, but I, I feel like the people that do come to our shows are a culmination of, of that type of people that feel like they don't belong at the show um, because we've got you know older people we've got younger people we've got people that listen to punk and hardcore and metal um, across the board and people that you know aren't into any of that music but they just may respect our message or our lyrics because we're very driven by the lyrics and our message of the band um, so I think like our, our audience in general is kind of you know, the audience of misfit toys, for lack of a better term. Um, we definitely have some hardcore kids that come out there to dance and do that, but um, it's not like a lot of bands where, where the majority of their fans kind of strongly lay within one camp. I see. I see. Okay, so it's so it's very much y'all are all over the place, and you can guys can and you guys have a very, ma you know, not a very non singular appeal. Yeah, and, and maybe that goes to the fact that we are playing such a, a wide variety of shows, um, or maybe just the fact that you know maybe these kids that are are, are the the tough guys that come to the shows to fight. They they hear our music, then they come to the show and they say this isn't what I thought it would be. Um, so maybe that weeds out some of the people that are very extreme in that one direction, um, and maybe it also bridges the gap, which I really hope it does, for people that maybe haven't listened to heavier music because. Um, something like the things we've been talking about has turned them off to heavy music then they come to our show and they realize well i could really have a good time you know i can meet new people here i can do anything that i want you know whether it be slam dancing or mosh pitting or singing along you know a lot of people jump on a stage and and grab the mic or crowd surf any of those number of things or you can just stand in the back and have a beer you know um so it's nothing that makes you feel pressured to say i have to fit into this mold of what a uh, a metal core or a hardcore show is I like that. I like that. And I will be, I'll also be fully honest here. Like when I first heard the name American Standards, I thought it was actually supposed to be, you know, fairly, you know, non, I don't know, non intrusive, not in your face. And then I heard the name Norma Jean attached to it as, you know, somebody to tour, somebody that you guys either sound like or have been touring with. And I was, I was confused when I actually heard Writer's Party Block. Exactly what we were going for when naming the band. Um, personally, coming from you know several other bands, uh, the biggest thing I wanted was to make a band name that when you hear the name, you don't already know or have an expectation of what the music should be. Um, you know, when you hear these bands names that have blood and death and carnage in it, or they they write them in the death metal font, you already know what you're getting into. I wanted to make a name that was maybe a little bit satirical. Um, and had, a, had kind of multifaceted meanings to it, but you also just don't know what you're gonna get into until you listen to it. Um, sometimes I think people either think that we're a uh, old school like cover band or a pop punk band, or maybe just a straight like political punk band. Um, and then like you said, they, they listen to it and, and maybe it shocks them up front. 
No, but no, but it was but for so for yeah, actually yeah. So for me, it was a very pleasant surprise. But lately, I've been having you know trouble where I hear new bands and I hear things like, oh, here's a band called City Under Siege, and I expect them to be like some, you know, I don't know, groove groove metal or some hardcore, you know, and then it turns out to be like you know pop rock, a la the Summer Set or Fall Out Boy, or when I hear. You know, a band like uh, this thing called this these these guys called Conniption Fit, and I think, okay, like your guys's logo and like the font and everything screams like doom metal. But I listen, and it's basic, and, it, and it's a throwback to Alice in Chains and Stained. So there's a lot in the name for me when I when I when I when I when I hear a band, right? There's like that. That's that's the first part of the impression, I think. Yeah, you know, maybe that uh. Maybe that turns some people on, and maybe it turns some people off. Maybe there's some people that haven't listened to us because they they expected to hear music that they weren't into. Um, it almost makes me think of, and, and we're nowhere by any means along these lines. But when you think of bands um, back in the early 2000s and late 90s, um, bands like um, say Corn or or Limp Bizkit, or even going back even more, bands like Hole, kind of like an obscure word or Slipknot. Um, when you think of those words now, you know exactly what style that is, because Slipknot now has the impression of being this heavy band. But when you first heard the name Slipknot, you probably didn't think of a heavy band. They've kind of owned that name. And Corn, I mean, another one that's completely off the wall that um, when you think of it now, it really has this whole uh, aura or like mystique that has been built into that word that originally had no tie to that style of music. I think it was the spelling for me that kind of told me that told me what I what I was going to get into when I picked up uh, a corn record for the that first time. Hit it, right, you know that backwards are really kind of meant. Yeah, that's going to be really grooving, uh, heavy rock. <laughs> what is it with uh, what is it with like new metal bands and like you know backwards letters? <laughs> backwards letters, you got to put like a Z in there or put like you know something like that. No, but yeah, like Lincoln Park did that with Hybrid Theory and Meteora. Uh, Limp Biscuit did that. Corn is, you know, with uh, you know, see you on the other side, man. Like it's never, it's never stopped. Yeah, no, it's something. That I think it was the edginess that, like, the appeal of teenage angst that a backwards letter would give you. Um, maybe we need to put our R's backwards, um, or, or something like that. Maybe our A upside down is another one. I see people use E's, the A's. Um, maybe that give people a better impression up front. Maybe when you guys are, you know, ready to kind of drop any sort of impression of nuance or mystery or, or mystique, and you really just kind of want to, I don't know, just kind of stop getting people curious, you should go for that. But until then, I like what you guys are doing. Uh, I do appreciate it, man. Like I said, uh, maybe we'll build some uh, some reputation around the name. But for now, I think every time someone asks me about it, uh, they... They already have a little bit of assumption of where it comes from, and then they they tweet us um, or tag us on Facebook at like 3 a.m. at night at the bar. Um, they're looking at down at the toilet and they're saying, "Did you guys name yourself after a toilet?" And we try to keep that part big. Now, see, like that's exact, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, if you guys if you guys can keep doing that, if you guys can keep getting tweets and you know Insta tags that you guys are there at that where where people keep on guessing. That's that's the best thing you guys. Could, that's the best thing you can do when it comes to an image. I think. Yeah, I mean, if people are asking questions, um, I mean, that's the right thing. Um, something that's kind of been interesting along the lines of getting people talking um, for this album release for Anti Melody coming up here. What we've really um, noticed is, as a band, and we've started around 2011. As a band, we've kind of consistently grown um, a bigger and bigger fan base. Um, and, and it's kind of been the steady, the steady incline, right? Where, for the most part, people they like us, or they, you, you know, maybe we've got some super fans, um, but we haven't had a lot of people that just so overtly hate us. Um, we've had a couple here and there, and we like to have fun with those. But, uh, but now with this new album, um, they premiered uh, our first single, "Writer's Block Party," um, Lamb Goat. Um, it got picked up by all kinds of media and press. Um, we've been doing tons of these podcasts and radio shows. And, and what we're starting to realize is we're getting so many people on both sides of the spectrum, these really super fans that have been just great and kind of sent us these awesome emails and letters and messages. Um, then we've got some people that have 
destroyed us in the comment sections and, and it's generally nothing about the music itself it's normally just like the way that we look they're like how oh, this guy has a you know uh amish looking beard or or this guy looks like a thumb with glasses on or whatever it may be you know so we've just been getting so much love and so much hate on both extremes of which as i to a lot of my other friends and bands um and, and especially bands that are a little more successful or a little more um further along in their career they kind of tell me that that's really where um you know that you're doing something right when people are willing to go out of their way to like hate you um and especially when they hate you for something like how you look and not the song itself you know that you're creating enough buzz and enough ears and eyes um to actually kind of push yourself forward no, but I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I mean, notwithstanding, despite notwithstanding the fact that I think that YouTube comment sections are filled with like the worst part of the internet, um, I honestly believe that if you've got like the fact that you've got people talking means that you're doing something right. It doesn't matter if they love you. It doesn't matter if they hate you. If they can say something about what you're doing. It doesn't matter if it's a criticism or it's a praise. I think that's all. I think that's all the you know all you need to do just to show up on their radar. Yeah, you know, before maybe people just didn't uh, hate us enough to spend the time on us. So now we're really making sure we're antagonizing them. And uh, we, like I said, we'll have fun with it when we when we get some of those tweets. Sometimes you'll see the threads of us going back and forth, um, and we we really try to give them a run for their money. And I've actually been, I've been thinking about this, but now you've actually given me enough courage to ask. Is there anyone that you'd really like to start a Twitter feud with? A Twitter feud? Oh, uh, shit. Um, I don't know. Maybe we could get this dumbass Trump in the uh, office to, to tweet us back or something, because he says some ridiculous stuff on Twitter. Um, you know what? I'm actually glad you said that because I've recent because I've recently uh, come up with the idea that I'm actually probably going to end up tweeting at him sometime during the week. Uh, step up, bitch, and uh, see how that goes. Nice, do it, do it. And tell, I'm, I'm mean, like I said, if he's in that mood, he'll send something back, and it'll be the most entertaining thing you've read all week. Um, we haven't. I mean, we haven't really tried to start a feud, although I think that'd be funny. Um, but we have had some pretty good conversations with people we never thought we would have uh, conversations with. Uh, Corey Feldman is one that very recently we started sharing some tweets with back and forth on Twitter, um, which Corey Feldman is, you know, from the Goonies, and, and he recently started this music career that's a little bit absurd. You can't tell if it's legitimate or he's just completely gone crazy. Um, but uh, we like to do that and kind of have, have that fun as well. All right, all right, I'm glad. And as we begin to wind down this interview, we, wow, we went back and forth for a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's good. I think I'd rather have this conversation than have the, um, you know, the, the, the interview where they first come out the door and they say, hey, tell me a little bit about your band. And then it's just me talking for like the next 30 minutes. Right, no, like we try to we, we try to do things differently. That's the entire I think that's the entire appeal behind BTB as far as things go. We try to do it so that we can get it so that you and I are talking rather than just Q and A, Q and A, Q and A and we're done. Yeah, it makes it more interesting. If it's like, you know, we're two guys at a bar uh, at a bar having a beer, having a conversation and sometimes it intersects with music in the band. And sometimes it goes on a tangent, but I think that's where the, uh, the interesting piece of it lands. Oh no, you're absolutely right. And I think that if we can start on a conversation, if we can go without having to correct ourselves too much, and if we can kind of just disregard the time for a bit, I think that's the biggest success that I can do as an interviewer, and I think that's the biggest success that I can enjoy as someone having the conversation in the first place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and you guys, you know, um, what, from what I've seen behind the barricades, definitely had some success lately. You guys have got some pretty big guests. I actually was listening to a few of them uh, today uh, when I was driving. I, I listened to the last one you guys did with Shandan, which Shandan, I've, I've known that guy for a long time. He, um, he actually is from Flagstaff, Arizona, and he used to book shows up there. He used to be in bands up there too. So, um, so we, we've known him, you know, kind of known him throughout his career of going uh going to the different labels and kind of landing at at artery where is that now and he's doing huge things oh man that's the shan the shandan interview i i i think 
I think I actually t interviewed that. I think I actually interviewed Mr. Haran the Wednesday after I uh, got into a car accident, so I had a concussion. But like, I had just picked up the microphone. And I was still just talking at him. But it was, oh man, I. It's good, you know. It was interesting, and like I said, just kind of having some history with him. Um, and, and we actually sh exchanged some emails. I think just a couple months ago, as well. But it had been a while, so it was kind of cool to to hear um, hear that side. And I think podcasts that do that that have both. Uh, bands and artists, as well as people that are inside the music industry, like promoters and record labels and A and R and things like that. Um, that keeps it interesting for both, because um, something you find out in a band very, very quickly is, you know, 60% of the crowd is generally people that are either currently in bands or they want to be in bands. Um, so when you bring some of this from the music industry on a podcast or in an interview, um, you're really catering to that market of people that are also listening that are you know wondering how do I uh, build my band yeah no you're absolutely right um, yeah no that's a, that's absolutely astute so my question is as we begin to wind down uh, on almost an hour which is probably the record con record length conversation that I've ever had recently is there anything you'd like to plug for anyone who's listening yeah, so we, uh, we're putting out our new album, Anti-Melody, uh, which is going to be available April 28th of 2017. The release show is going to be at the Rebel Lounge in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And right after that, we go out in May on a tour, which we're hitting 10 to 12 states, primarily through the Midwest, and then looping back around to Arizona. Um, coming back in June uh, with a show June 24th at the Nile, uh, which is that Zayo show that I was talking about, so one that we're really excited about. Uh, if you follow us on our social media, um, pretty much anything slash American Standards, whether it be American Stand or I'm sorry, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, any of those we're on. You can see our tour dates. We have merchandise. Um, we have the pre-orders up, which are also on iTunes and Amazon. Um, and you know, if you want to share a couple messages back and forth, shoot us something, and we pretty much reply to everything on there. All right, all right, all right. Um, and I can be found at uh, Pereira.k on Instagram, uh, G-R-N-D-T-H-F-T-A-C-D-M-I-A, that's Grand Theft Academia on Twitter, and on, on Facebook. So anyone listening, feel free to give any of us a follow, and we will be in touch. Uh, Brandon, thank you again for this lovely conversation. This was a great time. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for having me. This was a pleasure. I wish uh, more of these could be like this, where it's... Uh just you know sharing uh sharing some stories and having a good time so i'd be happy to come on again and um i'll also be following the podcast and listening to your future episodes all right that means a lot thank you sir take it easy okay.